Welcome back to another edition of Weapons and Warfare. For Straight Arrow News, I'm your host, Ryan Robertson. Just ahead on this week's show, we go one-on-one -on -one with an F-35 test pilot. We take an up-close look at the military's replacement for the Humvee. And in my wrap, I let you know my thoughts on the investigation into Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's absence from work and why it took so long for his boss to find out. But first, how about we tackle a few stories you may have missed? This spring, Lockheed Martin will determine if the modern generation of Patriot missiles can be used at sea by the U.S. Navy. Long a staple of American ground-based air defense, the powers that be want to see if the Patriot can be incorporated into the Navy's Aegis combat system. That system was originally designed to work as a sort of iron dome at sea to protect America's aircraft carriers. Since then, it's grown in scope and capability, and now the Navy wants to know if it can handle adding the Patriot to the mix. In a recent interview with Defense News, Tom Coatman with Lockheed Martin said the test will use ground-launched missiles rather than ones at sea, but they will be integrated with the Aegis combat system. If those tests are successful, Lockheed Martin would look to the Navy or the DOD to fund additional testing from ships at sea. For just the second time, the Air Force publicly acknowledged their next generation stealth bomber has taken flight. In January, a spokesperson confirmed the flight of the B-21 Raider at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Unveiled to the public in December of 2022, then Air Force Chief of Staff and now Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General C.Q. Brown Jr. said the testing phase with fewer actual flights will be different from that of any aircraft in military history. Because of all the digital information and the work we've done, the test points that we would typically do in a traditional program don't need to be as, uh, as many. Um, and that's the part we got to think through. And it's, and it's a cultural shift as well. Because you get it you know, for our, our test community, um, they like testing. Northrop Grumman Project is expected to eventually replace the B-1 and B-2 bombers. Meanwhile, in Ukraine, the business of war rolls on. Milrim Robotics out of Estonia announced at the International Defense Industries Forum in Kyiv last month they are looking into starting a production line of their Themis unmanned platform in Ukraine. Specifically, the combat, engineering, and casualty evacuation configurations. Ukraine already took delivery of at least 15 such vehicles, but it's far from a done deal. Milrim is owned by an Emirati defense conglomerate and final approval would likely come from Abu Dhabi. A sticking point could be the UAE's publicly held neutral stance on Russia's invasion. If you were one of the millions who enjoyed the Tom Cruise blockbuster Top Gun Maverick, then you no doubt remember just how much of the movie was spent talking about taking on fifth generation fighters. So it may surprise you to learn the United States actually has two fifth generation fighters, the newest of which is the F-35 Lightning. Built by Lockheed Martin and flown by the Air Force, Navy, and Marines, it's expected to be the U.S. military's frontline fighter for the next quarter century. And plenty of U.S. allies are lining up to buy their own. Recently, I had the chance to talk with an F-35 test pilot named Tony Wilson, call sign Brick. It was a great conversation, and Brick told me all the reasons he thinks the F-35 Lightning is the best fighter jet in the world. Since entering service in 2015, the F-35 established itself as part of the U.S.'s first line of defense. The jet's advanced avionics are also helping pilots become better, faster. What used to take, you know, a naval aviators, you know, we'll say eight to 12 years to achieve to become a, uh, a large force mission commander, you know, have the capability to lead a large number of aircraft into a combat scenario. With the F-35 and the tools that it provides to the pilot, pilots are attaining that level in two to four years now. One of the biggest advantages F-35 pilots now have is technology. Tools so advanced, they create digital pictures of the battle space, meaning dogfights are essentially a thing of the past. 
with a single F-35 and the capability that it brings to the pilot, you can identify um, almost anything that's out there. And if I know what I'm going up against, then I can solve any tactical problem, right? Because I'm able to exploit on the weaknesses of whatever I'm going against, as well as capitalize on my strengths. Uh, if I have the capability to uh, find, fix, and track an aircraft to you know, include what its identification is, then I can pick the best tactic to solve that tactical challenge long before this threat ever knows that I'm even there. And by solve that tactical challenge, that's a nice way of saying take out the bad guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, exactly. Landing radio check. Loud and clear. Once I'm airborne in the demo, you guys can reach me here. For the modern fighter pilot, the jet isn't the only technological leap making life in the cockpit a little easier. The helmet. We talked a little bit about it. You know, you, you have the six cameras, but the idea of like a glass plane, I just look around and I can see anything and everything I want to. Like when, when you were training to become a pilot, was this considered like... Would that, would that be magic? Yeah. If you had asked me or told me when I first started flying about this helmet, I'd have been like, this is something out of Star Wars, dude. This is not, you know, I'm never going to see it in my lifetime. And, and and now it's here, right? And we're only getting better with our helmet technology. So, you know, the capability I see today, I, I can only imagine and get excited about, you know, what's in the future with this helmet. Uh, we're running out of time. So I'm going to skip to my last couple of questions. What is the most unrealistic thing you've ever seen depicted in Hollywood, on TV, whatever, where you're as a pilot, you're just going, that's stupid. <laughs> um, Maverick Top Gun, when they said we couldn't send in fifth gen, right? Because of X, Y, or Z. The reason, you know, Maverick Top Gun didn't use the F-35 is it would have made the movie boring. They would have launched off the carrier. They would have picked their way through the threat. They would have put the bomb on the target and come back undetected. Right. I'm like, come on, really? You know, I, I understand the reasons why, but, um, but yeah, going back to your previous question about, you know, well, when I first started flying, you know, what was capable, what wasn't uh, as a test pilot, one of my roles is to uh, help engineers make the impossible possible, right? So I've seen what's where we've gone from fourth gen fighters to fifth gen fighters. And I, again, I'm, all, I'm just super excited to see what comes next. I want to thank Brick for sharing some of his time with us. We may just need to invite him back after the third Top Gun movie comes out. Yes, they are making another. If you're interested in hearing more of my talk with Brick, be sure to check out our Weapons and Warfare audio exclusive extra wherever you get your podcasts. For those of us of a certain age, it might be hard to believe Operation Desert Storm took place a little more than 33 years ago. Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. From that conflict, several American icons were born. Among them, General Storman Norman Schwarzkopf, the F-117 Nighthawk, and the legendary high-mobility, multi-purpose wheeled vehicle, otherwise known as the Humvee. How popular was the Humvee? Well, Arnold Schwarzenegger demanded he be sold a civilian version, and he was. Though it still serves our troops today, lessons learned in Iraq and Afghanistan spurred military leadership, to ask for a new workhorse to replace the now 40-year-old Humvee. Enter the Oshkosh Defense Light Combat Tactical All-Terrain Vehicle, or the LATV. After years of testing, this beast bounded into active duty in 2019. With a price tag of just $344,000, this four-wheeled ferocity is currently used by the United States Army, the Marines, and the U.S. Special Operations Command. There are four different vehicles and all kinds of variants available for users. The general purpose, the heavy gun carrier, the utility, and the close combat weapons carrier. On average, each LATV weighs 11 tons and is comparably easier to transport than its cousin, the MATV. 
so it can be sling-loaded under helicopters and fits inside a C-130. Fully fueled, the LATV could go 400 miles and pegs the speedometer at around 70 miles per hour. That combination of range and speed means the LATV is a difference maker when it comes to mission capability. But no beast is complete without a thick hide. The LATV is mine resistant and ambush protective with modular armor. It also likes to go for a dip when the opportunity presents itself. The LATV can navigate up to 60 inches of water even with all that armor. And if all that wasn't enough to make you a fan, last year Oshkosh Defense introduced the EJ LTV. That's right kids, it's a hybrid that allows operators to charge the lithium-ion battery while the diesel engine is in use. That battery then allows users to drive in silent mode. Perfect for those times when you want to sneak up on your enemy in an 11-ton vehicle. Of course, it's more than just an SUV on steroids that can get your soldiers or marines where they need to go. It can also be configured to carry a number of weapons, allowing troops to take the fight to the enemy. The LATV can be fitted with light, medium, and heavy machine guns, as well as automatic grenade launchers, anti-tank guided missiles, and honestly, I would not be surprised at all to see some containerized drone launchers on it at some point in the near future, which makes the vehicle an essential part of any modern battle plan. By now, you might be asking yourself the same question Arnold Schwarzenegger asked all those years ago. Can I buy one? Well, surprisingly, the answer is yes. If you want one and can live with the fact it doesn't come with armored plating or machine guns, you can have one. The civilian version is cheaper as well. All it will set you back is a cool quarter of a million dollars. All right, folks, it's time once again for comms check. It's one of my favorite uh, parts of the show because it uh, gives us the opportunity to check in with you, the audience. We peruse our social media channels, find a comment or a question that we want to respond to, or we use this opportunity to kind of update you, uh, the viewers, with uh, a story that we have done previously. So you ready to get started? I am. Let's go. All right. First comms check comes to us on a story that we had done uh, about MQ-9 Reapers, specifically the Marine Corps, now has 100 uh, Reaper pilots trained and ready to go. Which is kind of uh, the, the twist to that story was it, it's cool that the Corps got 100 pilots trained up so quickly when it wasn't that long ago that they took their first possession of an MQ-9 Reaper uh, back in 2021 when they got the funding. Um, for the audience members that don't know, a, a Reaper drone, it's, it's large, uh, it's a Category 5 drone, um, it means it weighs about 5,000 pounds, it's like a small plane, uh, and it gives the core, uh, or really anybody that uses the MQ-9 Reaper, gives them uh, a dedicated platform uh, at about 50,000 feet in the air, um, or ceiling of 50,000 feet in the air, uh, to be able to monitor the situation on the ground. Intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, ISR is what that's called. So the question comes from a few dad habits and a few dad habits wants to know why were we so late to adopt them in the core uh like i said it, it before 21 uh, the core didn't really use reapers really all that much they they leased some um in a contractor owned contractor operated setup uh 21 they got funding to buy their own um and so now now they have their own why did it take so long a few dad habits you kind of have to look at what was going on in the world prior to 2020 and then after 2020. Um, prior to 2020, the Marine Corps, their, most of their operations over the last two or three decades was based in the Middle East, landlocked. Uh, you can drive uh, within, you know, a certain distance of your of your enemy, of your target. And then uh, a lot of these smaller drones uh, that the Corps was using were hand-launched. You could just kind of throw it and it goes. Um, now, with Force Design 2030, with the Marine Corps uh, kind of doing a force posture positioning in the Pacific uh, to disperse their forces so that they can counter China and keep China in that first island chain, is what the military um, terminology is. In order to do that, that means the Marines have to be spread out. If you're spread out, then a little handheld drone that has a limited lifespan and a l very limited uh, range isn't going to do you much good when you need to be patrolling an area of a thousand nautical miles or more. 
the Reaper gives them that opportunity. Oh, and by the way, the Reapers can carry Hellfire missiles. I've ne never met a Marine who doesn't want more firepower. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. A few dad habits. Uh, we're going to move on now to our next comms check, which is actually an update to a story that we had done on the F-35 Lightning. Back in uh, December, Lieutenant General Michael Schmidt told Congress that there was a delay uh, in an upgrade for the TR-3 upgrade, delay in parts for the TR-3 upgrade, which basically gives the F-35 um, a whole lot more computer processing power, data sensory, and, and, uh, without getting too techy, it makes the plane better, okay? Uh, the general in December said that there was a delay. Uh, well, Lockheed Martin just came out and said of the... Uh, 147 to 153 range of jets that they were anticipating uh, delivering this year, that number is actually going to be closer to 75 to 100. So that's a pretty significant drop, uh, about a third of a drop of what we thought uh, they were going to deliver versus what they're actually going to be able to deliver. So not great news there. Um, the good news is the F-35 Lightning is, you know, the best, uh, one of the best uh, fighters on the planet. Um, it's probably, you know, F-35, F-22, they're both American made. So, you know, uh, good, good spot to be in for us. Uh, but if you are waiting delivery on uh, an F-35, um, bad news is you might have to wait a little bit longer. So we'll see how that goes. All opinions expressed in this segment are solely the opinions of the contributors. Well, we are just about out of time, folks, but before you go, I want to discuss accountability for a bit, specifically when it comes to our nation's leaders. If you're watching the show, that would lead me to believe you have an interest in military matters, which means you probably already know Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is under scrutiny for failing to tell his boss, the President of the United States, that he was in the hospital and could not perform the duties of his job. Quick recap. Austin was rushed to the ER at Walter Reed Medical Center for a urinary tract infection he developed after having surgery to treat his prostate cancer. That was on January 1st. On the 2nd, he was admitted to the ICU, but for four days, the Pentagon, the White House, and the Deputy Secretary of Defense were all mostly in the dark about Austin's hospitalization, let alone that he was undergoing treatment for cancer. There's been lots of hemming and hawing about why SecDef didn't tell POTUS or the Pentagon about his absence. Austin did release a statement saying basically he knows he messed up and he's going to do better going forward. But a member of the cabinet being unable to perform their duties is a big deal, especially when we're talking about the Secretary of Defense and there are some pretty tenuous situations globally. I'm not here to berate Austin for getting medical treatment. On the contrary, I hope he's fine and I hope he makes a full recovery. What I am here to do is ask, how is this acceptable? Where is the accountability? Folks in the military know protocol. They know chain of command. Austin should have known he needed to inform others that he would be MIA for a few days. And I'm not the only one wondering what was going through Secretary Austin's head. The chair of the House Armed Services Committee is as well. Congressman Mike Rogers scheduled a hearing on the matter for February 14th, Valentine's Day. Instead of a love letter, though, Rogers sent Austin a message that read, in part, I am alarmed you refused to answer whether you instructed your staff to not inform the President of the United States or anyone else of your hospitalization. Unfortunately, this leads me to believe that information is being withheld from Congress. Me too, Mike. And listen... Odds are, if you at home had an important job with people relying on you and you don't show up to work for four days and no one knows where you are, you probably would not have that job very much longer. But President Biden says he still has full confidence in Secretary Austin to carry out the duties of the job. So again, where's the accountability? Where's the punishment? As a leader, Austin is held to a higher standard. People's lives quite literally depend on the decisions he makes, and his decision to keep his illness and its impacts to himself could have put our country in danger, and that has to be answered for. Those are my thoughts. What are yours? Tell us what you think by commenting in the comment section on all of our social media feeds. Yes, folks, we do actually read the comments. 
Uh, but that's going to do it for us for this week on Weapons and Warfare. For senior producer Brett Baker, video editor Brian Spencer, and graphics designer Dakota Patillo, I'm Ryan Robertson for Straight Arrow News, signing off. Thank <laughs> you.